Welcome to the Business of Beauty, where we help beauty entrepreneurs in building their business and reaching their dreams. This is your host, David Lee. Our guest today is a business coach for the hair and beauty industry. He teaches a lot about prioritizing sales and marketing in their business and the incredible benefits this can have, especially coming out of COVID restrictions. They are the only company in the world in this industry that delivers fully paid clients to salons with no out-of-pocket costs. They handle all the marketing and sales for their clients, so they, don't, they have more time to deliver incredible services for their clients. He is proud that in just three weeks, they made a single salon over $56,000 in sales. That's 113 new clients and over 670 new bookings for their business. Total, his business has now made over 2.5 million in sales for salons across Australia and all over the world. His superpower might be a little strange. <laughs> he says his superpower is the ability to quickly analyze a business and isolate the problem they're facing. For example, he could spend five minutes talking to a salon owner about their problems and then zero and be able to zero in on what the real issue is that they're facing. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Billy Rickman at Rickman Media. Thank you. That was a really nice introduction. Thank you so much. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's quite impressive. Uh, there's there's just so much to talk about, but let's 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 take a few steps back and kind of can you tell us a little bit about more about your organization and kind of how you got started? Yeah, for sure. I'll give you the short version because the long version is um, will take up the entire episode. So uh, the short version is I left school uh, and went into the Navy. And I was in the Navy for eight years and I met a girl and uh, I bought her a beauty salon. Um, and I went over and did some service in Iraq and whatnot. When I came back, I found out she was misusing the money and I sort of, I panicked because all my business, all my houses were, my property sorry, was attached to the business. And so I, um, I, I separated with her and I, I threw myself into this beauty business, which I knew nothing about. <laughs> and um, from there I had to pay back all the debt and I, uh, I did so and then started my own business and started a, a franchise, um, a skin clinic franchise and um, sold that and then got into coaching and now marketing and now we have this full, all inclusive uh, sort of support system that we help to uh, for salons and, and businesses in the hair and beauty industry to grow and succeed. Wow. Now, how I guess from a time frame, how how long did all this take from like the very beginning yeah, so of you, working with your ex and now where you're at today? Yeah. So uh, that has been an 11 year journey nice. from start to finish. 11 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's been, it's been hell of a roller coaster ride, but it's been fun. So much fun. So much fun. Oh yeah, for I'm sure, for sure. Um, but. Yeah, it's been good. I, I wouldn't. I, I just look at it as a really, really expensive, um, a really expensive education. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's been a long term return on investment. <laughs> mhm. Mm mhm. Mm now, okay. So, tell tell us a little bit more. So, you, you fo it sounds like you focus on salons, right? Now, um, yeah. What uh, and and especially the the point the area of you know, uh, not having the salon pay out of pocket so obviously you need to make money somehow right everyone needs to make money so how 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 is that sustainable how are you able to help the salon but also be able to sustain your business model yeah right so one of the things especially with covid one of the things we found is that um, businesses struggle to um, have good cash flow right now and so we wanted to figure out a way that we could assist with um supporting people to keep trading in their business to grow in their business um, but not have to have that find that initial outlay. And so um, what we essentially do here is we have a full marketing team that creates um, a Facebook campaign as it were, or an Instagram or whatever it is that we're doing. Um, we try, try to focus on what we call a six week challenge, which is where we have a program um, that allows clients of the salon to have six services in a row for six weeks. And whether or not it's hair or beauty or skin or what have you, we've got different customized versions of that. Um, but the whole point is much like a gym does a six-week challenge in order to get members for the gym. Uh, we offer this six-week challenge in order to get people ingrained in the business. They come back week after week after week. So they feel that they're part of the business and um, you know, part of the culture. And then they never want to leave again. And so um, that's primarily one of the programs that we focus on a lot of, um, a lot of attention, a lot of our resource into. And so essentially what we do is we create this six-week challenge for a salon. We create the marketing for it. And because it is quite a... Um, 
it's not a, a high value program, but it's not a cheap service either. It's a $500 program that we sell it for um, to the clients of the salons. And so because of that, it takes some nurturing to get those sales over the line. So what we did is built in a sales team right here in our office. And so once that lead comes in, that lead then goes to our sales team and our sales team phone the, um, the lead on behalf of the salon. So what then tends to happen is the salesperson makes a conversion. We make the money for the salon. We make $500 for the salon. And then we transfer that money into the, into the salon's account. Um, and we hand over that client to the salon. So the salon doesn't really have to worry about the two things they hate the most, right? Which is marketing and sales. They hate marketing, they hate sales. So we'll do the marketing for them. And then we take that marketing lead and we actually sell to that lead. And then we take that money and deposit it into the client's account, into the salon owner's account. So the way we then make our money and without any out-of-pocket expenses to the business owner is um, we then take the, the cost of the program for the salon owner out of the initial takings. And so we say to the salon owner, you don't actually have to put your hand in your pocket at all. So you can literally sign up to one of our programs. We'll get you started. We'll build the marketing. We'll attach the sales team. And then one, only once you start making money, we then take out the portion and then we deposit all the rest of it into your account. So it actually allows them to get this brand new program um, have all of these resources that we have with our marketing team, our admin team, our support team, our training resources, our coaching, our um, sales, all of it. They get it basically for free and we just take our money only and if they make money, which we've never had a situation where they don't. So we've never actually lost money. Wow, wow, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so you mentioned the program starts at 500 or is there like a different like tier levels in your program? Um, the program we sell is for uh, fourteen ninety seven. So we sell to salon owners for fourteen ninety seven. That's how much it costs us. Um, but we um, for the for this client of the salon, it's yeah, it's five hundred dollars on that program. But we do have other ones as well. They have variations in prices. But for that one, we just kind of found the sweet spot is just around five hundred. Anything less, you kind of um, you're not making as good profit, and you attract a different type of client. Anything more than that five hundred dollar threshold, it becomes quite hard and difficult to to make that over the phone sale. I mean, asking a stranger for a credit card worth more than five hundred dollars over the phone can be quite challenging if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so we found that the sweet spot is around about that four hundred ninety seven dollar mark. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So what you're talking about for this for the salon signing up for your program, not necessarily like the end client of the salon, or are we talking about the end client? Yeah, that's where it gets confusing. So the end client is yeah. 497, the salon owner is 1497. Okay, okay. All right, cool. So so yeah, so thanks for clarifying it. So, so essentially your program working with the sal salon owner is 1497, right? Yeah. And um, they don't have to pay anything up front it's pretty much you're taking on the risk, right? You're we building the structure and you're suggesting, hey, you should run a program like the 497 program to sell to your customers, your end clients, right? Yeah. And um, and as we, as we bring in business for you, then you, you'll have the money to pay for our, our 1497 program. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And so we take all the risk. There's no, I mean, if, if they don't make money, then we don't, we don't charge. Yeah. Them for yeah. It. yeah. Um, <laughs> they don't make money. You don't make any money either. So. Exactly. Right. And so, yeah. um, it comes down to some people like, it just sounds a little bit too good to be true. Like it's so it's for us, it's like, why would you put your money into another marketing campaign or a different initiative where you actually have to pay an upfront cost and then you run the risk of, oh God, what if it doesn't work? Um, yeah. Whereas we're saying, no, no, don't even worry about putting your hand in your pocket at all. Don't transfer us any money. We'll just take our money from the money we make you. Mm, um, yeah. And on average, so the, the balance is, is like I said, for the salon owners, one thousand one hundred ninety-seven dollars. But on average, we make we run the campaign for um, around 20, 21 to twenty-eight days, and on average, we make around about twenty-five thousand in over-the-phone sales for nice. the salon. Nice. Um, and then once those clients come into the business, we then find that our data shows that it's normally a one for one um, in a sense that if we make them a dollar, then normally they pay a dollar in the salon as well in things like retail and upgrade. So we make them $25,000 on over the phone sales, but it turns into a $50,000 program because the salon owner then makes more money once those clients come into the business. Yeah, yeah, it's that lifetime value of that one customer, right? It's not like they, they get their hair done once, right? Or even two times, their hair keeps growing, right? They want to right. keep maintaining it. So so yeah, the lifetime value of that customer is is, is a lot more than that. Uh, man, so like just, just listening to your model, like 
you're 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 only charging fourteen ninety seven. I mean, like oh, you're you're making us a lot, like twenty five grand, fifty grand. Don't you sometimes think like, man, I should have just charged commission. I should have just taken a percentage. And that's why I thought originally when I saw it, I'm like, oh, maybe you're doing a commission. So you're doing a yeah, fixed well, fee then. Yeah, for full transparency, we do take a little commission on the sides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think that's fair too. You know, because uh, if I were to hire a salesperson, right, that's essentially the role that the part partially what you're doing. You're doing marketing and sales, but just on sales, right? I would need to pay commission and sometimes a base salary for a salesperson so yeah we've got to do that and we've got to we've got to do that and because we don't um we don't outsource any of the work that we do everything that we do from marketing support training sales um, is all done in our office so we we have yeah like you said we have the expense of the the base salary plus the commission on the salesperson that's attached to that program we've got to pay the yeah. marketers and developers so it does work out for us to be a lot more than the 1497 but um we do pay we do charge a little bit on the um, commission on the sale but not a lot at all um, and really for us, it's about, we, we have a bigger program, which is called a Limitless program, which is a $22,000 program. And for us, we use this and something maybe that sound owners can, can hopefully identify in their own business in, yeah. is that you should have a sales funnel and marketing funnel for, you, for their business, right? And so for us, what we do is we sell the six week challenges, our initial front end program, yeah. and we make them so much money and we give them so much value in that initial program that by yeah. the end of it, they go, I want to keep doing more business with you. How do we do that? And then yeah, we funnel yeah. them into our like main program. That's and I think um, I think the sale owners they they miss that a little bit because they're always just trying to sell their their high value service all the time. Like they're trying to sell their cut and yeah. colors. They're trying to sell like their their balayage or whatever it is. When oftentimes it's easier to bring people in on a lower value item, show them how good you are, and then move them into your high value services. Yeah, yeah, and, and I love your model because like. Um, uh, just recently I was, I was talking to another like marketing agency company and they try to pitch me and they're like, yeah, you want to join the program? I think you fit right into the elite program. So mind you, I just met them. I don't know them very well. And I was uh, like, yeah. you know what, how much is this elite program? 30,000. <laughs> okay. So you expect me to write a check to you for 30 K for the next, you know, like six months. And, and there's like no assurance, right? I mean, I, you know, like I know marketing and sales is not perfect, right? There's no guarantee in life, but at least, you know, there's no risk on, on, on uh, the other end, right? Whereas in your case, you're taking on all the risks. So, which is, it sounds like a really good deal, but at the same time, because you have the knowledge and expertise and you've done it for many, many salons, you're able to mitigate that, right? Yeah, so we, we started this actually during COVID as a virtual version. So we, we had all of our salons like obviously closing down and things like that and, and, and being shut down. Um, and so we actually started this program as a virtual version. We thought, how can we make it like a six week challenge company for uh, online? Mm -hmm. And so we, we ran this version of it where people could consult with their, um, with their hairdresser or their esthetician or what have you via Zoom and they could get some advice and then products will be sent out and, and they could do some certain things at home with some instructions and tutorials and whatnot. And it was kind of just a way to, to, to get through that period of time where, you know, people weren't making money. How do I keep my doors open? How do I pay my staff? How do I do these things? And we, so we sort of came up with this idea. And because of the intensity of the, um, the situation and because of the, the challenges that we faced, it kind of served us in a way that we had to problem solve very quick. We had to innovate really quickly. And so a lot of our testing and, um, and data analysis actually stemmed from being challenged so much in the, at the start. And we were able to fast track, um, you know, what worked and what didn't work and to, to do that assessment quite quickly so that we are now at a point where I could, I could honestly get on the phone to anyone and just say, just, you know, just sign up, just sign up because I know I'm going to make you money. And I have no qualms and hesitations in saying that because we've done it now so many times. Yeah. And I said to someone the other day, I was like, have you ever sat in, it was to a hairdresser, I said, have you ever sat in the chair and someone's like umming and ahhing about their new haircut and thinking, oh, should I get it? Should I do it? Should I not? And you're sitting there saying, just, just trust me. You're going to look amazing. Just trust me. And in your mind, you're thinking, I've cut this hair, this, this, hair, this style so many times. Yeah. I know that you're going to look great, right? And that's what you're thinking. And you wish that you could just transfer that benefit of your experience and knowledge onto that client so they could understand that, no, no, you're going to get an amazing result here. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel about our programs now. For anyone who ums and ahs about things, I'm like, just 
Just trust me, I've done it so many times now. I know that you give me your money, I'm gonna make you a lot. And I'm, I'm so confident in that because we've tested and, and done so much analysis of what we do. And I yeah. think a lot of that has come from COVID being challenged so much to innovate. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, actually, so can you can you share a little bit more on like, you know, some of your analysis, what you've seen, some of the some of the patterns, especially now being in Australia, some of our audience is, is in the US and we have some in, in the, in the um, UK, so in Europe, so it's all over the world, right? So have you seen any differences, any variations, and also this overall trend of where we're going to? Yeah, look, I, I think, because um, we work with clients all over the world as well, and, and obviously even in, in the US, it's it's different in California than it is to South Dakota, and different to Florida, right? So even in the US, like the, the state's really different restrictions is, is immense. Like, so it's, yeah. it's almost not even country to country, it's state to state in a lot of ways, yeah. right? Um, and so, um, what, what we, I can only give you really what we see, right? And one of the benefits that I find is hugely valuable is that we, in my company anyway, we're dealing with both the business to business side. So we're dealing from, okay, so how are salon owners feeling? Like we have that relationship with salon owners, but also how are the customers of those salons feeling? Because we, we're dealing with those as well on the phone. And um, I guess across the board, what are, one of the things we, um, we're finding is that people are still, quite optimistic um, people are still willing to spend money they just want to they're just more cautious about what they spend their money on and they want to know that the value is there whatever they're spending money on that there's value in it and so they're, they're a little bit um, I guess more cautious about spending their money but we haven't seen this whole um, you know I don't want to spend situation we, we like I said like I said our salespeople on the floor sell to strangers over the phone this $500 program and we're getting credit cards from people in all parts of Australia, New Zealand or wherever it is. Um, and we have no relationship with that. And so there's, there's a real trust factor there to hand your credit card over $500 on a credit card to someone you've never spoken to before, never been into the business before, have no previous relationship. And so that in any world, in any economy would be quite a hard sell. Yeah. Um, but we just haven't seen this, this you know, um, negative mindset. We haven't seen this pessimism. We haven't seen people just stop spending. It's just that they want a little bit more uh, reassurances that what they're spending their money on, they're going to get value for that money. Mm -hmm. And if you have a sales team or we have a sales process or you have people in your business, even if you're a solo operator, you know, running a hair salon or you are a big business doing, um, selling products and e-commerce or what have you, people are still willing to spend money. They just want to know that what you're selling is a value and they want some reassurances that they're going to get value for their money. And if you can, if you can mitigate that and you can have some really good value propositions, value stack propositions, where people feel like they are getting money, um, you know, value for money, then we just haven't seen businesses really dropping off. Now that's what we've seen in Australia and New Zealand. Um, in the US, again, it's a state by state. We're dealing, we don't do the sales part in the US. We just sell the program in the US, but not actually the sales part. Um, but again, it's state to state. Some people just say, I don't know how we can make money. And we're talking to them about the virtual version, doing the online version. Um, but then other states in the US, it's like, yeah, we're back to business now. We're, we're pretty much trading as if we were prior, pre-COVID. So um, I guess my advice to business owners would be that they just need to maintain optimism and don't let their clients see fear. Um, you know, you need to be the, the, the pillar of hope for your clients and say, no, no, we're all good. We're going to be great. And if something happens, if we do get locked down again, if we do have restrictions, then these are the safeguards we have in place. We, you know, we pause any payments if they're on a subscription or, you know, if they're booked in and they paid in advance, we guarantee you will pay you your money back. Um, just having some of those, you know, safeguards in place so the client feels that they're reassured they're not going to waste their money because that's really what they're holding on to right now. I have the money. I've been in lockdown. I haven't been able to spend it on fuel. I haven't been going to restaurants. I haven't been like pampering myself. So I have money. I just want to know that if I spend it with you, I'm going to get value for that money. And so um, that's kind of what we're seeing as a trend overall. Okay, nice, nice. Now, have so um, like, I'm not sure how it is in Australia, but like, you know, certain states are getting into, you know, full lockdown. You can't even go to a salon, you know, like what, yeah. What would you do in that scenario if, let's say, you know, one of your clients, a salon owner, says, "Hey, we, we got to shut down." What what would would you change the marketing? Would you change the sales process? I mean, what what has some of your clients have done? Yeah, again, um, see, one of the, one of the things that was different. Let's just say Australia and New Zealand. So um, we had this virtual version of six week challenge, and I can I can talk through that. Um, but again, some differences was in New Zealand. 
what, when they had their lockdowns, they weren't even allowed any postal service deliveries, right? So it was a full, there was, there was, no, um, there was no deliveries of products or anything like that. And so the virtual version we had in Australia where it was like, we'll do some online consultation with you. We'll get to know your hair or skin or whatever, whichever one, everyone it was. Yeah. Um, and we can provide some level of consultation and instructions and tutorials about how to use some of those services at home and do some of the work at home that doesn't border on being dangerous. You know, we're not doing any of the services that we were doing salon that, would, that potentially could be dangerous to do at home. It's just sort of basic getting you through um, services. Yeah. Um, and, and we were able to do some of this virtual work and then send them those products in the post, right? Or, or a delivery service. Mm. Nice. Um, whereas in New Zealand, they couldn't do that at all because they couldn't even batch up any products to send to people if, yeah. if that was the case. You know, in your so again, it depends on how um, severe the restrictions are in wherever they are in the world. Um, the first version where you do have a delivery service, then definitely look at doing that. So providing some online consultation, running some Facebook ads, writing some free online consultation with their hair or skin, creating a, um, a whole set of pre-recorded videos that help them so no, you know with hair like how do you look after your scalp at home how do you look how do you properly wash and shampoo your hair which a lot of people don't actually know how to do properly mm. um how do you style at home for you know having little gimmicky videos or like um having a hot date night um having a restrictions hot date night inside with your with your partner you know and how to jazz your hair up for the night in or whatever it is yeah. having some of those pre-recorded videos um that give people tutorials instructions on how to do that you know, what to do with your split ends at home, um, all these li different pieces of advice. And if you can send, if you do have a delivery service available to you, then sending them some retail product or sending them some low grade professional products in the post that match up with the consultation that you're doing online. You're not, by doing that, you're not going to make a million dollars. You're not going to be uh, like a millionaire overnight, but what it will do is allow you to sustain that relationship with your audience. Yeah. It will allow you to actually generate at least some income to keep your bills paid, to keep people employed. Um, and what it will also do is when you when your restrictions do eventually ease, and of course there's a lot of talk now about vaccinations and different restrictions easing up. Mm -hmm. um, when they do ease, you won't be on the back foot like your competitors. You will still have an engaged audience that know you, they're still service, it's being serviced by you, they still want to do business with you. And then you're able to then just sort of hit the ground running. Um, yeah. If you don't have the ability to provide um, like postal deliveries or anything like that, then doing the same thing, but try doing it like on a, on a group session, um, instructional basis. So what I mean by that is like the difference between a personal trainer in the gym who does a one-on-one -on -one session and makes $100 an hour doing personal training or the person who goes down to the park and charges everybody $50, but then has a class of 30 people, right? And then they make a whole lot more money because they're doing a group <laughs> session. Yep. You can do like regular weekly Zoom calls with a group of 20 or 30 people where you provide hot tips and advice on how to look after your hair and skin at home during lockdown. And you just yeah. charge people like a nominal amount, like $10, $15 for that. And if you get 20, 30 people, then and you could run two or three classes a week. You can still generate $300, $500, $1,000 a week from doing group online virtual sessions about how to look after your hair and skin at home. It's about being a little bit more creative and just not going, oh my goodness, the world is ending. You know, we're doomed, I can't do anything now because I can't cut hair in my salon or I can't do facials in my salon. There are other ways to make money. You just need to really like figure those out. And then depending on, again, your delivery service and what your what your restrictions are, if you are able to deliver and you do those groups, groups sessions, you can have like a, a percentage, uh, you know, a coupon code at the end or a discount code at the end where it says like, if you enjoyed this session on Zoom, go now to our e-commerce store and you can actually get 20% off by using this code. And then that can actually bolster your retail a lot where people, we've seen make, people making tens of thousands of dollars in e-commerce um, simply by hosting group sessions and then trans, transitioning them to their online store. And so there's, there's a ton of ways, if people want like more ways, I've got a long, long list of them. Um, they yeah. can just contact me, I'm sure you can you know, contact details. I, I can help them out, no problems at all. Uh, but there, there are a ton of ways, even in restrictions and lock, with restrictions to lockdown, you can still make some money. I love it, love it. Yeah, there's a lot of golden nuggets here. I hope, I hope everyone can keep up with all the notes, but no worries. This, this is recorded. They can backtrack. And, yeah, and I just realized I was thinking this way yeah. so long, man. I was like, oh, like, I get carried away sometimes. Sorry. Oh, this is great. This is, I'm the same way. Sometimes I get so, so like passionate about you know certain topics, and it just, it just, it just go all out. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, now, from a marketing standpoint, um, it's part of your program. Now, what what are your thoughts about like paying for some of these ads, like Facebook ads, Instagram, uh, uh, Google AdWords, right? For a salon that's starting their marketing, maybe they've just been casually doing Instagram, let's say. 
is it worth spending money and putting money into some of the paid uh, ads? You know, you're probably getting me on a bad time um, with asking me this question because our account got banned from Facebook recently. Uh, so I, I've got a bit of a bit of a taste, a bit oh. of taste in my mouth with Facebook. Oh man, I know, I know how you feel. Like Facebook's so hard to get a, get a hold of too. Also, yeah. oh man, they're, they're impossible. And so, and a lot of marketing agencies are saying the same thing, right? Since the U.S. elections, um, they, in order to, I mean. Rightly or wrongly, we won't get into the politics of it, but um, in order to minimize, I guess, uh, external influence, they had to put up a lot of um, protection mechanisms in terms of who can advertise, fraudulent advertising, um, obviously fake information, false information, all that sort of stuff. And so they, and in order to do that, they obviously couldn't find that many people who could help. So they have to automate their processes, right? And obviously they're a business, they want to make profit. So they automate yeah. a lot of their processes. And so what ends up happening is through these safeguards and automations and protection systems that they put in place, the security systems they put in place, they, they, they can go rogue. And so you're just a, um, you know, a small business, you're trying to do the right thing, but you say the wrong word or you put the wrong image into one of the ads and all of a sudden you're just like, it's disabled. And then they don't have enough people in their customer service and concierge team to, to get through all these, um, you know, uh, people requesting reviews of these, of this, um, these disabled accounts. And so it can now take four, six, eight, three months, four, six, eight, 12 weeks, sorry, and three months to actually get someone to review your case. Mm -hmm. And so businesses now who rely on Facebook are kind of in this purgatory where it's like, <laughs> Facebook marketing is my business, right? Yeah, Facebook, that's a curious business, thing. Uh, I make money and now I don't know. And they don't tell you like your case will be reviewed in two weeks or four weeks. They say, we'll get back to you soon. And you, you're like, they, you just don't know what's happening. Um, and then eventually, you know, they can just turn around after waiting for two months and say, nope, we're not going to re reinstate your account. You've been banned. And they had this line, which is like a killer. It's like a dagger to the chest. It says, this is our final, this is our final um, decision. No more decisions will be made on this account. And, so, and after that, you've got no way of coming back. And it literally happened to one of our marketers yesterday on his personal account. And um, he hasn't marketed on his personal account for six months because he uses our agency account. Then t two days ago, he got a message from Facebook. It says, um, uh, your account is, power, private account has now been disabled. We're reviewing, um, we're reviewing some of the policy breaches you've, you've, um, you know, you've, uh, you've breached uh, marketing with Facebook. And so he wrote back to them and says, I don't know why this happened. I haven't marketed for six months, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next day he just gets a notification that says, you've been now permanently banned. This is our final decision. You cannot, you can no longer market on Facebook. Wow. Which is for him as a marketer in this company is, could be life changing because that's his livelihood. Like he needs that, that ability. Yeah. So I guess in a really long winded way, this is not just happening to us. This is happening to different industries, different companies, big companies, small companies. Um, where it's just a, a massive complaint all over the world right now that because of the US elections, people are being caught up in Facebook security, new security systems. Yeah. And people are just getting banned and disabled and permanently, and, and to the point where they permanently cannot advertise on Facebook. So my answer to your question is there is no better bang for buck for small businesses than Facebook and Instagram marketing. Nothing, nothing exists, which is why people become so passionate when they get banned. Um, you cannot, like Google is still great, but that's a long-term marketing strategy. You, you don't do Google marketing for two weeks. You don't do Google marketing because it's quiet and you need to bolster marketing for next week, right? It just yeah. doesn't work like that. It's also expensive and complicated if you don't know what you're doing. Oh yeah. Mad, like direct mail, like, you know, putting a flyer in someone's letterbox, that was great, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but now it's just totally redundant. Yeah. Especially with COVID where you <laughs> may not be able to go outside. Right. Um, there's, there's all these different marketing strategies, but in terms of return on investment, if I put a dollar into something and I want to pull the pokey machine and get something back, there's no better return on investment than Facebook and Instagram marketing. However, it does come with that caveat that it is so, you're so vulnerable when you put all of your marketing eggs into that basket because yep. overnight it can be turned off and there's no recourse. You can't go back to them. There's no big, there's no one-on-one -on -one concierge team where you, hey, can you just have a quick yeah. look at my account because I think it'll be unfairly disabled. There's none of that and then your business can evaporate overnight. So yeah. you really have to be careful what you're doing and just know that things may be good for a while, but overnight you can, you can lose it. Um, and so you need to diversify your strategy. So some of the other, so some of the other diversification strategies I'll be looking at is really still building your email list because that mm -hmm. 
at this point in time is not really controlled. There are like email credit scores and things like that, but as a as a rule, email marketing is still very flexible. You can still maintain control over your list and who you email to and things like that. So that is definitely like a primary market strategy. Um, we call it SMS. I don't know what you call it over there. Like yeah, text SMS. messaging. Mm -hmm. Text messaging, yeah. Um, SMS, like really building your SMS and text messaging, um, because again, there's no real restrictions. I guess maybe in the future there may be, but right now, if you have a list and you you follow the you know um, privacy uh, laws and legislation, then you can still SMS people. Yep. Um, so definitely those two. Other other apps and platforms like um, Pinterest, especially for hair and beauty, like Pinterest oh, yeah. is a really big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Snapchat, I would be marketing on Snapchat, especially if your audience is of like 30 or, or younger. Um, right. It's still, people, people like think the Snapchat isn't really big anymore. It's still huge. Yes, they didn't get their projections and maybe Evan should have went and when Facebook tried to buy them, they should have maybe said yes, but they didn't. So, but, um, but Snapchat is still around and it's still a massive, it's still hugely consumed by, by a massive audience. Um, and, uh, and things like, I don't, I don't know what the laws are now in the US because there was, it was a bit of up and down about what can and can't be done on TikTok. Um, but TikTok is still a really fast growing platform. It looks like I think that Microsoft is going to buy it in the US. Yeah. So um, yeah, so TikTok will still be around. So TikTok is still a, I mean, the, the rate of growth in TikTok world is just insane. Yeah, like something right. you've never seen yeah. before. And, and you can create, if you're doing Instagram reels, then you can do TikTok. You're like, you feel like, oh, what's TikTok? I've never used it or I look complicated. Go on Instagram, go to the stories, and you'll see a section there called Reels. Practice doing some Reels, and if you can do Reels and you want to diversify your marketing strategy, then put those Reels onto TikTok. It's the same thing. Um, and so, like, there, there are a couple of the other digital uh, marketing platforms that I would be looking at to diversify. Uh, right. But again, I've, I've just spoken for a really, really long time. Sorry to <laughs> just to take it. But yeah, really, I, I love it. So really, the to sum to summarize is like you know if you're gonna we're gonna play with fire be careful you might get burned right but you know, yeah, nothing exactly. wrong with with facebook and instagram it's it's really great but don't put all your eggs in in one basket i've seen businesses that that only have a facebook page and that's insane to me like why would you only yeah. have a facebook page because if your account gets banned it gets removed what your whole business online is going to get wiped out Overnight. Yeah. <laughs> overnight right that's crazy yeah. so don't yeah. do that always be in control of that even like i've seen where um they they rent websites right you have like these like wix and squarespace ones technically you don't have control over that either um so they could technically yeah. pull the plug and there goes your site too so i always think about being in control of your business as much as possible and diversify like you just said so um, 100%. Yeah, I could, yeah, that's that's really good summary. It's exactly what it is. Play with fire, you you, you may get burned. <laughs> you get burned. <laughs> it's like you know. Yeah, but yeah, what's your email? Fire to cook. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like what your what's your email list? Zero. What's your SMS list? Zero. What's your Instagram? We don't have one. But we've got twenty thousand people on Facebook. So yeah, but that, that is a risky yeah. strategy. Yeah, great risky now. But <laughs> what about the future? Yeah, and just just to give context, I guess to to some people like. Um, you know, does Facebook care about the size of your business on whether or not you have um, the, the the ability to, for recourse and things like that? Just to give people some context, we probably will spend in the vicinity of $3 million on Facebook ads um, in 12 months. And we still have no no direct line to Facebook, right? And so- you haven't, you haven't hit in the billions yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly my point. So if you're thinking, yeah, but we spend $5,000 a month on Facebook, like surely they wouldn't want to lose that business. They don't yeah. care about those numbers. So um, it's really not even a size thing unless you're mad, like you said, they're not, if you're not at that billion dollar mark, they really don't yeah. care about you. So yeah, um, exactly. If you're not like, on like Forbes, if you're not top 100, you know, Fortune 100, <laughs> you know, they're not going to care um, because yeah, you, you have to, um, uh, you, you actually have to, when you get verified, you actually have to, um, you have to put your, uh, upload your, your front cover of the Forbes magazine um, to show that you're on the front cover of Forbes and then you get verified <laughs> for your client. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's that's what they finally a, a, assign you to a account rep, right? That's, I mean, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How many mansions do you own? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh man. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're totally right. But also, I think on Facebook's end, they're they're just too big. They they they've grown so fast. They can't manage it. It's just too hard to manage. And plus, they're getting hit with with I think uh, just earlier today, um, Congress was hitting Facebook with some sort of like like a lawsuit. So they're getting hit with a lot of stuff too. So no, you know, the it's that they yeah, yeah. All the data. I think it's privacy data. So stuff like that. I mean, as a business owner, I mean, sure. If you see the opportunity to bring in, bring in uh, um, leads or sales, definitely go with that for now. But also make sure, just like what Billy has said, to have um, diversified. Take that client into your own ecosystem, even though Facebook hates it, right? But bring it in in some other ways, right? And that way, it's part of your email uh, list. SMS, you have the phone number, and now they're, they're, the client is truly yours, right? You're maintaining it, it's in your ecosystem. So I love that. 100%. And I just, want to, um, I just want to touch on that point just quickly. For people who don't know, maybe you're not in the marketing world, or maybe you're just not into this sort of stuff, um, and some people genuinely don't know this, Facebook also owns Instagram. And so if you're sitting there now going, yeah, but our Instagram page is, <laughs> is popping, like we got a massive Instagram page. Like, no, nope, Facebook owns that. And if you get banned on Facebook, more than likely you'll lose your Instagram account as well. Yeah. Um, and likewise, if you, and ultimately, like, if you lose your Instagram, you're probably going to lose your Facebook account. And just to rub more salt in the wounds, they also own WhatsApp. And so if you think we market on WhatsApp, it's like, you they own that as well. And I think actually they own Tinder as well, I think now, right? Really? So oh, well, I didn't know that. I know they own Oculus, and there was a big complaint about that too. And that's not nothing so much on the on the business world but oculus is the vr goggles right yeah, so yeah. if you get banned on facebook and all the apps and games that you bought on oculus will get wiped out like sorry you're banned now <laughs> yeah and, and there's no there's literally no recourse for it there's no yeah. you can't even go to the you know sue them i mean people try but they don't they don't get very far and say yeah, you yeah. know you rule my business I'll say, yeah but you breached our vague privacy and <laughs> privacy policies like which is so vaguely written. Yeah, it's, so, you know, like you said, you really want to, you want to be in control of your marketing list. So whenever you get a Facebook follower or you get an Instagram follower, whatever, if you can then link them somewhere where they have to submit their information and then that information gets saved to an Excel spreadsheet or it gets saved to like a Google sheet or even Google, <laughs> they Google learn it, but uh, it gets saved somewhere where you own the actual, con you own those, yeah. um, the, the contact detail. Now you have power. Now you have control of your marketing because you can then upload those into different platforms and still maintain control of that database. It's when you put all of your your eggs in um, in somebody else's basket, in another business's basket, and that's when it can just be um, taken away from you. You really, really need to avoid doing that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, uh, I've I've we've already spent uh, so much time together, and I'm sure we can spend for hours talking about this stuff. It's yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, we, we can't, we, unfortunately we can't do that. Um, but how can our audience reach you for more info questions and also learn more, more about your program? Yeah, it would be a little bit hypocritical now. So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so in, in all seriousness, you can, if you search on Facebook, Billy Rick official, so facebook.com is actually official. Um, Instagram is Billy Rick underscore. Um, and if you go to those two platform, um, platforms, you'll see a bunch of resources and things where you can find me elsewhere. The other way you can find me is on the podcast, on any good plat um, platform, so Spotify, uh, Google Podcast, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, any of the big podcast um, channel platforms. Um, I do have a uh, podcast called The Billy Rickman Show. And right now I'm on a, um, on a bit of a, an experiment. I'm doing 365 days in a row of podcasting. So um, I sort of, I, I put a post up on my Facebook 30 day, 32 days ago. And I said, I'm gonna do 365 days of podcasting in a row where I have to actually record it that day. Um, so it's not like I'm gonna pre-record 365 days. Oh, wow. Um, so, so you're not even trying to batch. You're you're doing it every day. That's, every that's day, hard. Yeah. That's really hard. Really hard, right? And so the, the point for it is that, and, and so if they go to that post and they comment and, um, and share that post. If I fail one day, even if it's like because of, 
death, <laughs> sickness, famine, blood, whatever it is, if I miss a single day, then anyone who's commented on my post, I have to pay $10 to. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of the 10 people who commented, but if there's 10,000 people who commented- Oh man, you're gonna go broke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like an experiment in accountability and how quickly or how much can a, can a program grow if you're consistent with it every single day? Yeah. And so I'm kind of doing a public um, experiment to see how that works. So if you, if you want to listen to my podcast, um, they're short little episodes, about 10 minute episodes every day. Uh, for 365 days in a row, you can just find it, search for the video and show podcast. All right, yeah, for sure. And and no worries if, if uh, viewers, if you didn't catch that, it will be in the show notes, it will be in the description down below. So no worries. <laughs> like, what was that? Right. Uh, and again, uh, <laughs> Billy, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, um, and and maybe ho hopefully we can have you back and when uh, after a whole this whole COVID thing ends and you can tell us what is going on with the salon world and how that has changed, you know, in the post COVID world. That would be awesome. I would love to. It's been an absolute pleasure coming on and, and chatting to you today. Yeah, for, for sure. Same here. Well, uh, viewers, hope you uh, enjoy uh, this episode, and we will see. Hey, you beauty nurse. Yeah. I'm David. My team and I created a website kit for fellow entrepreneurs looking to grow their business online, whether it's e-commerce or a service-based business. We've got you covered. This will also help us continue our webcasts and provide valuable knowledge to countless beauty entrepreneurs watching. For more details, check out our website kits at beautybiz.info forward slash website kits. If you like the videos that we make, you can support us by giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel. Thanks, we'll see you next time.